Hello everyone and welcome to a very special interview with the developers of Life is Strange 2. Um, my name is Stacy And I'm Mari. Um, <laughs> so we thought we would turn things over to the developers and let them introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what they do. And then we'll be asking them some questions about the development of Life is Strange 2. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Jean-Luc Cano and I'm uh, one of the co-creators of Life is Strange, Captain Spirit and Life is Strange 2, and I'm also the writer of these three games. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so, hi, my name is Michel Cor. I'm one of the two creative directors of those games uh, with Raoul, and uh, I'm also more in charge of the art direction and, and some of the narrative design of, of the game. And my name is Raoul Barbet. I'm the other creative director with Michel uh, on those three games. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm, we'll say I'm more in charge of the, of the cinematographic aspect of the game, so camera and also the music and sound, and of course the design, we, we share all, all the design uh, all together. Well, great. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, did you want to start us off, Mari? So with our first question, I was wondering, some of you made a visit to the United States between the making of Life is Strange 1 and Life is Strange 2. Were there anything, was there anything you saw or did that influenced Life is Strange 2? Was it like how you imagined it? Or is it, was it different? Mm, I think, yeah, it's it was really interesting when we traveled there with, um, I mean, I think it was just in the beginning of the project, we did a, a big road trip with Raoul, uh, trying to go to some of the places where the two brothers are traveling in the game. So it was really important for us to, to go there to, to have some real documentation to just not just use, um, use movies or books or TV series as references, but really be there so we could take pictures, we could talk to the people we'd be meeting on the road uh, to really get the, the feeling and the vibe of, of the journey, but also really more importantly to to get some inspiration from real stories from, from the people we would meet. Um, we, we, we had been there already before, even for the first Life is Strange, uh, not directly for real documentation travels, but um, I mean, before the first life is strange for some uh, just um, travel with the company, I used myself a lot of time just also to take a lot of pictures of the of the Pacific Northwest, and I think that was when we fell in love really much with this part of the United States. Um, I think it was when I was near Seattle for for a job for a company meeting with with Dontnod, and I had a, a free day where I could just go go near the coast and I took a lot of pictures and it was one of the first inspiration for the environment for the first game. Um, so you've mentioned before that telling that after telling Max and Chloe's story, you wanted to explore a completely new story with new characters. Life is Strange 2 explores many different themes from the first game, including American politics, the experience of Mexican Americans, and immigration to the US. What made you decide to tell this story in particular? Um, I think when we finished the first uh, the first season of Life is Strange, uh, it it was meant to be a standalone game. But Square Enix asked us to do a, to do a sequel. So we with Michel and Raoul, we we asked ourselves uh, what is the real DNA of Life is Strange, not as a standalone game, but as a series. And uh, with a lot of discussion, uh, we figure out that. Life is Strange was about uh, relatable characters, about uh, talking about social issues and uh, and uh, difficult themes and actual themes we want to tackle, and also with a bit of supernatural stuff on the top of it. So um, I think that uh, we wanted to explore with this second season new themes and talk about new subjects we didn't uh, have the chance to explore in the first one, but um, there is also the fact that we don't start to create the game by choosing the themes. We, we start by imagining imagine the stories, imagine the, all the cool scenes we can share and uh, we, can, we can have in the game. And after that, we, we put some themes we want to explore on the top of it. I found 
it very interesting uh, also that you chose to ha- go from having the player character be the one with the powers to having it be um, a non-player character with Daniel in the second game. Was that a choice that you made from the beginning or did that kind of evolve during the development process? <clears throat> yeah, I think it's um, it's during the very beginning of the process, like Jean-Luc uh, was explaining, it's... Uh, even when we were talking about the power itself, uh, you know, we, we had a lot of discussion about a lot of different powers. Telekinesis was one of them, but there was also other powers. And sometimes the players still have a power in this season too. But very quickly, uh, I would say as soon as we know uh, that we wanted to have a brotherhood story and uh, something more about the education, uh, one very specific moment we say, okay, maybe the brother could be the one of the uh, the, the little brother or, or, or the nephew or the uh, uh, not, not the player. And I, I think it give a lot to what we wanted to explore this education scene and of also to the consequences, of course, of your choices. And uh, I think it changed a bit the way the player has played the season two. And it was interesting in season one to, for example, see players. Uh, uh, play without rewinding. We, we have a, a lot of feedbacks of players who wanted really to to play as max and role play the game and uh, move on and try to not use the rewind power. So it was really interesting. And in the season two, of course, it's quite different because you don't have the power. But I think it changed the way you play and the play, the way you see the choices. Uh, so yeah, it was the idea to as it change and we're quite happy because it changed also the way you design the choices and uh, and the consequences. And I, I think also on a more on a secondary point of view it was interesting since we are in Life is Strange we are talking a lot about um, people who are powerless against what's happening around them, against society, against um, uh, against exclusion and what's happening um, in the world. It was interesting to also put the player in these shoes to be somehow powerless. Uh, and uh, it's, as you've seen, it's quite hard for Sean to get out of most situation. And the fact that also in the gameplay point of view, he doesn't have the power and he has to just use his dialogues and decisions making to try to shape somehow how Daniel would use the power. It was a kind of reflection of this bigger idea of exclusion and, um, and discrimination. And uh, it's the first time I think about that, but I think this, very quickly we had the sequences without Daniel. As soon as we have written the story, very quickly we wanted to have a, a long moment without Daniel to make the player feel the loss of power, but also the loss of someone you love, here, uh, the little brother. And it's quite the same as the episode two of the first Life is Strange, where when we try to get rid of the rewind power, and here, the fact that the power is linked to a character is even more powerful because you miss the character and the, the joke and uh, your little brother, but also you miss the power. So I think it was very quickly uh, something we wanted to have in the episode four. Excellent. I think that you did a really good job of conveying the feeling of powerlessness. I think that that was something that we talked about a lot in our playthrough, uh, was that feeling. Yeah, I think I, I really liked, uh, I think it was you on, on Twitter, you had a, uh, a description of what you thought was what we were talking about in the game, and I really loved the way you described it. I think you described it better than we ever managed to do it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think that that was you, Mari, right? What? When you were talking about how the, uh, I can't remember exactly what you said, but when you were talking about like the main theme of the game, how it was, how he was struggling against not having the power and stuff. Right? Yeah, well, he didn't have, he wasn't seen as being allowed mm-hmm. to fight back, which was really sad. Yeah. I think we, we tried to push that even in, in the in the four endings of, of the game. It's a, you, you see that there is really no good choice or good way for Sean to get out of all this. There is sacrifice in each of, each of the endings. And it was important for us to have this powerlessness feeling up to the end that you have to make compromise because the society is like that and you have to compromise with what you're dealing with or the, what, what is uh, around, around you because I, yeah, I think for ev- 
everybody, and especially for for teenagers like Sean and Daniel, it's uh, it, life is not fair around them. It was important for us that those endings were somehow not fair, also to reflect reality. Oh yeah, we definitely have a few questions coming up about all those endings. <laughs> <laughs> On uh, a side note, I was wondering, you guys did a really good job with authentic characters and settings, and I was wondering if you had any cultural advisors on staff for Mexican Americans or homeless youth, because I felt like a lot of the dialogue felt really natural, because sometimes in media when somebody speaks bilingually they'll just like add in random words and it doesn't make sense but when sean and daniel were talking it felt a lot more natural like the flow between two languages cool thanks thanks for, you. for, for saying that um, um we we tried to document ourselves a lot with um, um uh, with raul and jean-luc and also with the team uh, with our narrative designers uh, working on, on on the different subjects and and our writer also christian divine um we didn't directly add um specific um what was uh, consulting but when we were traveling we did a lot of interviews of people we were meeting uh, meeting on the road and then i think that the way we worked was more to Yes, yeah, to read a lot of articles of testimonies, um, and uh, I know that our narrative designers who were in charge of the different scenes uh, did a lot of research. I mean, for example, the dialogue with the Mexican couple uh, in uh, in the prison cell. There was a lot of research done by Jean Luc when he wrote this scene first, and then uh, our narrative designer worked also a lot on just making sure that everything sounded right, and uh, we also worked with. Um, the location localization team from Square Enix and the Mexican one to make sure that it sounded right and we were not making mistakes in in the Spanish Mexican parts of the dialogues. Yeah, what what we wanted to do is to to present this difficult subject and this culture and uh, all the people that Sean and Daniel are meeting on the road with the most um, accurate and sincere way. That's um, and that's why we made all of these researches because. What happened in Sean and Daniel in in a game, you know, in Life is Strange 2 game, happened sometimes in a, in real life to uh, to people, and sometimes it's very hard stories and really difficult topics. And we are making a game that talks about these difficulties. So we really wanted to be uh, um, respectful to, uh, to to this kind of topics and uh, make the good researches to be. Uh, to be honest and um, and the most accurate as possible. And uh, and I think uh, long, the language uh, in general is uh, you, you talk about the, the dialogue and the way it's written, but also uh, uh, the language itself here was really important as their their father is um, is an immigrant and uh, even for example the number of words you use from your father or from your father language or from American language was uh, important even f from the first episode to not, uh, I would say, be a cliche by putting some Spanish words uh, like this. And so it's important to find the the right amount of words uh, in Spanish, and uh, of course to to be sure that the accent, uh, the wording is 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 good when they speak Spanish. But even when they are just the two together. All the enano, this kind of small words, you you really feel that they are. It's part of their culture and their heritage, and it's something that is really important for, of course, all the people from uh, immigrant people because it's part of yourself. But you're sometimes you're ashamed uh, because of that, etc. So uh, it was interesting uh, topics to to deal with. Well, I think that that certainly connected with a lot of people that. Uh, we saw watching our playthrough of the game because we saw a lot of comments from Latinx people talking about how it felt very authentic to their experience. Um, cool. cool, thank you. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the number of new environments and characters being introduced each episode, um, we noticed kind of right away that Life is Strange 2 is pretty complex. 
So how did you manage this complexity during development and what made you decide to kind of expand the game so much in that way? <laughs> uh, I don't know, it was really complicated. Yes. <laughs> more, complicated. <laughs> more complicated than for season. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure that everybody in the team uh, <laughs> loves us for having that many environments and characters. Um, uh, from yeah, from the beginning, it's something that we wanted to somehow to change the formula to also to surprise the players to bring something new to just um, not do again the small town setting where everybody knows everybody and everything took place in the same environment. We we love this setting and uh, uh, it's it's a really great setting. It's a, it's a cool to work with, but it was important for us to try something new to also to renew the interest and have a different pacing and different situations. So that's why we decided to go with this uh, road movie structure where you would just be on the run and go on this journey and meet characters in a place, learn from them, teach them something, maybe bring, change some of their life and quickly leave them behind and find new people and you are missing the people you, you found before, but you have to go on in advance. And it was a big, yeah, a big challenge technically, but also a big challenge for the players because it was really different for them. And it, I know that it had, uh, it was some some players were um, reluctant to enter to this setting because it, they felt like, why do I do? Why should I care about this character since I know that I will leave him in two hours? Um, but it was important for us because when we were traveling with how it was also exactly when you're traveling, it's exactly like that. You are meeting some people you. Sometimes you have a strong connection with someone in, in, a, in the course of one or two hours. You, you, you talk with them and then you, you know that you're going to your next destination right after and you have to leave them behind, but you keep them in your memory. So it was something we wanted to have in, in this game. Oh, that's cute. Yeah, <laughs> I think that one thing that that really gave you the sense of was that there was no real safe space and that even when you got to a safe space, you knew that you were gonna be leaving very soon. Mm -hmm. And so it always just kind of gave you this, you know, it added to the feeling of being on the run and not having like a, like a home to go back to. Cause I think in the original game, you always kind of feel safe when you go back to, you know, Max's room or Chloe's room. That's kind of like a, like a home base, but Sean and Daniel never really had that. Mm -hmm. And yes. Uh, yes. This is so, uh, exactly, and uh, we wanted at one moment to break a bit this, but it's I think it's soon in the story, so maybe it's it's not working so well. But it's with the uh, grandparents, mm -hmm. and the idea was to also show uh, a new family cocoon. Uh, but that, like you say, as always. Uh, a pressure over your head and you always seem you understand that it's, it's not going to to stay like this but I, at least we wanted to have this moment where you, you try to find another place to live and uh, of course family is one of the possibility uh, uh, but it's really interesting yeah, what you say and I think the beginning of episode 3 is also the flashback when you go back to your house is also interesting for that and a bit uh, earth-breaking because uh, you also see what you will miss and uh, what, what the brothers are going to miss those, their whole lives, the, the past and the, the cocoon of the Seattle uh, house. So it was interesting to have this flashback at this moment to also make people and players realize what the, the luck we all have to have. Uh, at least some friends or family or house, uh, so yeah. Yeah, I think that really in the end, the only safe space that they have and that wanted to push for the player is that it's their own brotherhood bond. It's uh, really just Sean and Daniel don't, doesn't have anymore any safe space or like you said, but we wanted to push that what they have is just them together. And it was important to try to push that for the endings to, to work also for the mm -hmm. players. Yeah, I think the flashback does a really good job of kind of showing you everything they're leaving behind and that kind of never, things are never going to be the same for them again, no matter what happens. It almost kind of like sets you up for the endings that, hey, you know, 
no matter what you choose for the endings, it's not going to be like the happy, perfect ending. Oh, you haven't, you haven't found the happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's something we wanted really from, from the beginning of the, the development of the story is to not have an happy ending or sad ending, a good ending or bad ending. Every four ending of the game was as this bittersweet tone. And we wanted to show that, um, to explain that in real life, you can be, there is no, no choices that will make you really, really happy or really, really sad. There is also uh, this gray area like, like in real life. So um, that's what we want to, to do with these four endings. I think that some players might beg to differ that some of the endings are really sad. But yeah. Really? <laughs> There is still there is still hope in every ending. I think. Yeah. So I was actually curious about that since um, the nature of the different endings and the choices uh, that you obviously it's meant to show that you may need to accept a compromise. Um, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the game's message about hope, given seemingly insurmountable odds and everything that these characters go through. Hmm. Well, that's a... <laughs> That's a big, big question. Big yeah. <laughs> um, I would say that in each of the ending, in a way, there is there is still hope. Um, even I would say the darkest one is, of course, the one where Lucian is getting killed. Um, and you still see in the end that Daniel um, has his power. It can be violent, but there is still this small moment at the end where he's still sparing the life of, uh, of one of the three thugs that is uh, assaulting him. And so for us, it was still showing that, OK, even if you had this walkthrough where you were showing that your own interests are, should be put first before the interest of, of society or the others, and you have so Sean who is getting shot, we are still showing that, in a way, Daniel can find a way to, to have his own life. Uh, and is maybe not the darkest character that uh, that that he could be. And for the other ending, there is there is hope in all of them. Uh, I know that the ending with the, where where Sean goes to jail is is harsh because he's lost so many years of his life. But you can still see at the end that both of them start a new life where they're free and they can decide to live their lives. That's why why we have Sean who you know take his car and go back somewhere on the road but no it's it's free it can it can be on the road without being being chased by the police or anything so it can in a way start uh, to try to get back the, the all the years he has lost before mm -hmm. that's making me cry yeah that's the first <laughs> ending we got and we both cried <laughs> so what, what, what was the ending did you what what ending did you have the first one we had was the where Sean goes to jail, and we we're like, never mind, we're going back. <laughs> <laughs> and we had them both go to Mexico. <laughs> no, wait, no, they didn't go to Mexico. Yeah, the second one we... Sean went to Mexico, and Daniel stayed in the U.S. That was... Okay. When, we... yeah. <laughs> I, uh, when, when, I, when I did my playthrough, I had this one, too. I, I finished with the, the grandparents' house uh, with Damien. Mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah. The, the, one, the one with the prison is, uh, I think, is really emotive, and the fact that it's in a, uh, the like Michel was saying, the, the 15 years, uh, I would say, the, the waste of uh, part, uh, one big part of his life, etc., and uh, also the, the scene with the brothers. Even when we were working on them and we were uh, doing. Maybe not at the motion capture, but maybe after with the camera uh, work and the music and uh, each time we play it, uh, it was uh, it was quite quite difficult for the whole team to work on that because even for us, uh, having seen uh, all the journey and uh, what the the brothers has has seen and uh, the difficulties they have caused, uh, to see this ending was quite quite uh, powerful and difficult so even to frame and edit and. Uh, so since the beginning, we knew that it, it would work, <laughs> yes. but uh, we were really, really surprised uh, by, the, of course, the emotion of uh, players uh, playing it and uh, 
I think a lot of people from the team have cried while watching people crying on YouTube. <laughs> so, yeah, it, uh, it's really, really, it's great uh, as creators to see that some, I would say, 3D characters can uh, carry uh, emotion like that. So it's always uh, impressive. Well, and, I'm glad you enjoyed making us cry. <laughs> <laughs> You being sadistic and loving to make us cry, which ending <laughs> would you guys have picked for the Diaz brothers? If yeah, mm. non non poetically, where everyone is sad, <laughs> just the one that you would have picked for them. Oh, um, uh, you mean you mean as a player? If we haven't, yeah, uh, okay, as a player. Yeah, um, it's generally as I told you, I uh, when I did my playthrough. I had the, the, the ending where Sean is ending to Mexico with the, with the drifters and uh, Daniel was uh, at his grandparents' house. Mm -hmm. um, so I, personally, I don't, I don't know. I think um, just to, to expand on the idea of these endings, uh, one fear at the point uh, uh, we had was, uh, you know, it's a question, uh, do, are those endings too fatalist? I mean, we have, um, it's complicated when you have a game about some message like the, the game we have, where all of our four endings are showing that basically there is nothing that you can do that will make everything perfect, which can be seen as fatalist, but it was also important for us to reflect that, to be, make sure that, because we don't have a solution for, for oppression and what's happening to, to, peop, to, to kids like Sean and Daniel. So it was important that we were not um, finding a miracle solution that will make everything happy for them because it wouldn't be realistic or it would erase some of the message of, um, of uh, the systemic oppression they're facing or, or how our society is working. So I, I don't know, I think it's a question of do you prefer for them to be together even if it involves violence and rebellion and do we, do we agree about that or do we prefer to accept the uh, unfair laws of society and have them have shown at these 15 years in prison and then there they can be free and together after that I, I don't know i don't know which one i prefer to be honest mm. but what is sure is that there is no good or bad endings you know every every endings of life is strange 2 is like the first season every ending is canon because it's uh, they are all depending on what you chose during the game so there is no uh, right ending or wrong ending and uh, oh sorry. No, you go ahead. No, no it's just um, I would say uh, it's uh, Raoul speaking, so it's just, uh, I, I would say uh, it's difficult to choose. Like uh, Michel was uh, agree with Michel uh, about all the point, but I would say because I know uh, as a designer what is inside those endings, I would pick the the two of the the brothers uh, in uh, in the in Battle of Boss, sorry. Uh, because of the music, because I love, <laughs> I love the score of uh, Jonathan Morali for the two endings in uh, Puerto Lobos. It's a score he, uh, he had to create it in uh, two weeks, so very, very quickly, because, uh, as you know, we have used some original score from the first episode for the endings uh, with the grandparents and for the endings in the, Into the Woods. But for those ones in Mexico, we wanted to have a new score, a new... Um, music and he has composed it very quickly and um, I was so impressed by the the strength and the, the power of this music that uh, yeah I, I love the sending for, for those reason and uh, and it's just a detail but I wanted to talk about it so <laughs> well they were very moving for sure I'm still broken about it thank yeah. you <laughs> um was there but you have a blonde Daniel and a lot of people love the blonde Daniel so no, I didn't like it. <laughs> he looks like an in sync band member. What uh, was there anything, any fan feedback from Life is Strange One that you considered or took into consideration when making Life is Strange Two, or did you guys just stay pure and follow your hearts? Yes, yeah, they, they asked to have Max and Chloe back, so we. <laughs> <laughs> We have followed the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And no, yeah, I, I think it's always difficult when you you try to do something. Yeah, and uh, here it's like a number two, so it's quite difficult because it's Life Strange two. You say, okay, let's do, uh, let's see what was working in Life is Strange and what the best feedback. I think you have to be careful of not be too influenced, even if it's it's great to see some feedbacks and to understand what has worked or not. Uh, maybe one of the weakness of the first season, I would say, is, of course there is some technical issues because of the time, the budget, and our, te our technique for animation, etc. So we have tried to improve that for sure, and I hope it's better in the season two. But I think maybe on a, the choice, the consequences aspect, maybe. Uh, Michel could talk about that in the narrative, but it was more the, the endings. We wanted to have really to have the player feel that the endings are right with their playthrough, and we know that uh, after the first season, some player has been a bit disappointed by uh, the ending sometimes. So this is something we we have tried to to be careful, but uh, it was also. Yeah, I think we are really happy with the ending of the first season, but we know that, of course, we have tried to to add some some things in this new season, and of course, it's okay. There is more endings, and they are maybe longer, and uh, you see to see that what is happening years after it's really strong. And maybe on the like like how said, maybe on the on the writing uh, for the dialogues we. For the first Life is Strange, we had this setting that was uh, really encored in teen movies, uh, pop culture, and the characters were written in some kind of stereotypes based on those kind of archetypes from teen, from yeah, from from the teen movies. And I think that for season two, we tried to have them to write them, write their dialogues in a more naturalistic way somehow. Uh, and I think that's something we can improve on. Uh, and um, but we tried our best here to make their dialogues feel more natural most of the time. This one? This one. Oh, uh, it felt like Sean was a much more defined character than Max was. Was there any part of the writers in him, or was he his own separate person when you wrote him? Um, I think, I, I'm not really sure that uh, Sean is more different than Max was, because when you create um, a main character, you you want that the player be connected to him, so you, you try to, to, to define him, but it will be more defined by the choices the, the player will do. You know what I mean with, with this? So um, that's, I think we, we put some, some stuff in his background, you know, in the stories he had when he was, uh, when he was a kid with, with Esteban or with, with, with Daniel. But when the, the real game begins and when the story begins, I think Sean is defined by, by the player choices and not really by, uh, by a background or by, by his own story because we want the player put his own story and his own feeling in this character. And just to con to add on what Henri was saying, I think that some part of what you're saying is because when you play Max in the first Life is Strange, she, she's coming back to Arcadia Bay, so uh, she hasn't been here for a long time, so she, she shares that with the player, the fact that most of what's happening, she doesn't know about it. For Sean, we had still to create a bit more of immediate background for him because he's, uh, he's been living in Seattle his whole life, his whole life. So I think that's also where we had to, and that's maybe what's giving this feeling that it's a bit more defined is also because it's his home. And it was the opposite that Max was coming back and they didn't know wh where she was going in Arcadia Bay. And for the opposition was knowing his life in Seattle and he, he, he loses this life right in the beginning of the game and then is going into the unknown uh, during the journey. This one, this one, and that one. Oh, um, so with all of the 
increasing complexity in video games these days and, you know, episodic releases where you're constantly adding new content for every episode. Uh, we were curious, you know, aside from your exact experience on Life is Strange, what your opinions are on the normalization of crunch time for game developers. And we, we are not aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think it's for sure a reality in this industry, uh, other industries and uh, cultural media or cultural, I would say, um, industry, sorry, are, I've got this problem, but uh, yeah, I think in video game it could be some things that some teams or producer or publisher or whatever are used to and uh, it's and I think it's it's a it's a big problem. Uh, just to talk a bit about episodic format, for us it was really difficult. Uh, of course, because it, it it it's not like creating one game. For for example, here for including Captain Spirit, it's like three and a half years of work. So it means that in three and half sorry three and a half years you will ship like six games. So. Uh, it's a lot of work, and you are a bit always uh, under pressure. Uh, I think we we are, we I don't have a crunch uh, time problem. I would say uh, we are really lucky uh, here in at Dortmund. Uh, we don't want that. We don't uh, force people to stay or this kind of stuff. But uh, we know also that some games. Uh, even uh, during the production phase or the, uh, on the financial aspect, they have to crunch to be able to finish the game, and it's, I think it's a problem. And uh, uh, a lot of people talk about that now, so uh, also a lot of companies um, are really uh, understandable. And uh, for example, when you can begin in a company, they will say that there is no crunch time, and it's something we we haven't seen before and it's really great because it's so important to it's just it's a passion but it's work and it's really important to not use the fact that it's passion to use people and to break their life uh, outside the work so it's important to have free time even for the creativity and everything if you you have to see your friends your family uh, to have time to do other stuff than just creating games uh, because it will give you a lot of uh, ins and uh, will to continue, so it's really, really important. And yeah, again, we are quite happy here because on all the projects that don't know, it, 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 it's sometimes you've got some periods that you have to work a bit more, but it's it's not as fast as I've seen in other studios for yeah, sure. But even even if, like you said, it's I would say better than what we know from some other places. I think it's still somehow. Too much, even there shouldn't be, but it's it's complicated because it's we should find a way to make games without having any need for any of our time, um, and I think it's really great that uh, this issue has been brought to light more um, in the press and to the public, because I think that there is a responsibility for studio and games to try to not have any crunch, but also there is a I would say in the end a responsibility for. What will happen is that if we completely reduce crunch, it means that for the same price in the end, some of the games cannot be that long and that big. And I mean, if the players get used too much to having huge games that are hundreds of hours and perfectly polished and everything, and if those games has, have has been made only with a lot of crunch time, uh, what could be really bad if it's if the player are thinking that for their money they want this quality, because it means that to get to this quality, every other game studio has to crunch to reach this quality. So we need somehow in a way to, that I think it's something that every studio needs to fight to not have crunch. And it means that in the end there sh might be a reducing in length or some quality of some aspect of the game that the player also should in a way accept. Because the, re the reality is that sometimes uh, if you cannot make this game without crunch, it, and it shouldn't be it shouldn't be solved this way, and the player shouldn't expect the, the, the games to have this level of quality and polish. 
Yeah, I think that certainly once you get increasing expectations from players, it can kind of increase the pressure for crunch even more, you know, than if it's just coming from a publisher. Because if players are continuously expecting more polished, longer games, more environments, everything, it just, everyone just needs to adjust their expectations, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's, uh, I think that it's getting better and better, and hopefully it will advance in a good direction. But it's uh, really um, something that I would say every studio has to push for if we want yeah, the player base to to get realistic games for the price. Well, I think those were uh, the bulk of our questions that we had for you today. Um, Thank you so much for speaking with us. The one last thing that we were really curious about is kind of taking into account like the entire game and all of the things that you've talked about with us today. What is kind of the main message or feeling that you'd like people to take away from their experience with this game? Uh, it's a big question. <laughs> yeah, and I, and, I, and I see there, there is a, a lot of course uh, thing we. It's, it, it's always difficult to 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 say um, we want people or we want to make or people change or change their mind or etc. It's not. I think. What is really great with video game is to put the player in a situation where you can make them think about the situation and the people involved and uh, to maybe... Because, for example, I think a, a, a big percentage of our players will never be on the run, will never be chased by the police, will be, never be without any money uh, in the wood, etc. So video game is great for that, to put them in this situation to maybe when they meet someone that has to live in the streets because of uh, difficulties with their family, because of uh, uh, personal uh, problems or uh, sickness or whatever, they, they can maybe think a bit before changing them too, too, too fast. Uh, this is something we have discussed a lot before beginning this uh, project is that of course, because of the uh, the question of immigration, you know, there is in in Europe uh, more and more immigrants, also because of the climate and uh, uh, conflicts, etc. And uh, so every day we have we talk about that, and I think it's great if the game push the player just to think a bit before judging uh, other people and judging people that they met uh, in the street and. It's so easy to have a quick judgment on someone else uh, without, uh, yeah. So if it works a bit on this, uh, it's cool. Yeah, I um, totally agree with uh, with, Ra with Raoul. To to say that this, I think this game share a, a message of tolerance and uh, acceptation to uh, to the to different kind of people and. I think that I would love that the the players of Life is Strange 2 yeah, can be more tolerant uh, in their own life. It's, if there is one thing they can take from the game, I would love that uh, that it will be this. Yeah, yeah I think that they, they summed it up so that um, really cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, that thank you so much. Um, this game was really powerful I think for both of us uh, we really enjoyed playing it and um, also wanted to just give you a huge thank you for taking this time out of your Friday night to speak with us about all this stuff um, yeah we really appreciate it thank yeah. you so much um, I know thank you very been, much yeah we've been kind of following you guys since the original game so this is really know, cool for us we've been, we've been doing the same so I no, think no don't <laughs> Yeah, I think we can also thank you for, I mean, uh, us and the team, when we were working on the first Life is Strange, we were really eager to look at your videos and, and see your series for between each episode. I mean, that's so embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's real. I think that everybody in the team uh, looked at your videos. So, oh my God, uh, no. Thank you for those. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> so much pressure. Okay. <laughs> um, well, for... 
viewers watching, um, all episodes of Life is Strange 2 are out now. It's a really powerful game. Even if you've listened to this whole podcast about it, I think there's still a lot that you can get out of playing the experience yourself. Um, I believe Captain Spirit is also free to play right now. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So even if you, you don't want to to pay, uh, you can test Captain Spirit. Yeah. And uh, it's really different from Life is Strange 2, of course, but I think we are all here... Uh, uh, really fan of uh, this small game because it, it's something a bit different and we were really happy to to create this story so yeah don't hesitate it's still free and it will stay free forever i hope and uh, yeah it's available all right thank well you. thank you so much thank you so much thank have you a very great much. day bye thank bye -bye. you bye 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 bye